Let's open up to the book of Revelation, and we are in Revelation chapter 6. And we're only going to look at the first two verses here tonight as we really turn a corner here in the book of Revelation, and we go from the heavenly scene in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, and now we go back to the vision of the earth and the scene from heaven back to the earth, and we see the prince who is to come. That's the title of tonight's message. Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. The prince with a little p who is to come, speaking of the coming of the Antichrist into power. So Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Remember, Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 dealt with the things of the church age. Jesus came in Revelation 1 to John, the beloved apostle on the Isle of Patmos. He told John uh, to write the things which you have seen, write the things which are, and write the things which will take place after these things. Uh, Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 dealt with the things up to and including the church age. Uh, In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the uh, phrase in the Greek, metatauta, where Jesus says, after these things, metatauta, we see John is in heaven. The church is now pictured in heaven from this point on. You're never going to see the church on the earth uh, in the book of Revelation from this point forward. The church is in heaven, uh, picturing the rapture of the church prior to the coming of the Antichrist and prior to the beginning of the tribulation Period. We saw in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus Christ, uh, the Lamb of God who had been slain from the foundations of the world, who is also called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that he received from the right hand of him who sat on the throne the scroll that had seven seals. The scroll, as we looked at in the last couple of messages, uh, is the title deed to planet earth, which Jesus purchased with his blood. Jesus bought the earth, not that he cares about this planet. Uh, He's going to rule here for a thousand years, and he's going to burn it all up with fire. He bought the earth to get the treasure, as Matthew chapter 13 tells us in the parable of the man who found a treasure hid it in a field, sold all that he had to purchase the field in order to obtain the treasure. And Jesus already told us in that parable, the field is the world. The only one who gave everything he had to purchase the world in order to get the treasure within the world, the church, uh, is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ takes that which is rightfully his, which is possession of that which he purchased with his blood, possession of this earth. And he is going to come back and he is going to set up his kingdom. There's seven seals that are on this scroll. And as each seal is broken on this scroll, uh, the scroll would be unraveled and a portion of what was written in the scroll would be read. Most Bible scholars believe that it is detailing the judgments in the book of Revelation. That's what those seven seals represent. Each seal is broken, and then inside the scroll is written the judgments that God is going to pour out. Those are the terms and conditions of Jesus coming to take possession of the earth. It's God pouring out his almighty wrath upon a Christ-rejecting, Satan-loving world. Those are the terms and conditions of the contract. Jesus is coming back to take possession of this world by force, and Satan has no chance. So we see, after Jesus is glorified in Revelation chapter 5, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Uh, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor and glory 
and blessing. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is receiving the worship of all the host of angels and of the church that are there in heaven, represented by the 24 elders who are seated on 24 thrones, each wearing crowns. And Jesus is receiving worship because Jesus is God, because only God, as you know, is permitted to be worshipped in the scriptures. So here we go from that heavenly scene of Jesus getting ready to take possession of that which he purchased with his blood. Now we see back on the earth the coming of the Antichrist, the one uh, who is coming in order to fake out the world, deceive the world, trick the world into believing that he is Jesus Christ. He's coming as a counterfeit. Everything Satan does uh, is a counterfeit, as we're going to see going through the book of Revelation. It's one counterfeit after another because he's a liar from the beginning and he is a deceiver. So we read in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals, remember there were seven seals on the scroll, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, those are one of the seraphim that were there before the throne of God that we were introduced to in Revelation chapter 4. And I looked, John says, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So tonight we really get our first look at this individual who is known as as the Antichrist. I've entitled the message, The Prince Who Is to Come, and I want to make sure it's a prince with a little P, not to be confused with Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, with a capital P, uh, and Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As a matter of fact, we get our title, uh, The Prince Who Is to Come, from Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, where Daniel uh, sees uh, this uh, prophecy or is given this prophecy from uh, Gabriel, the archangel who came to him and showed him the future or told him what was coming in the future. And we read in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, after the 62 weeks or the 62 sevens, seven year periods of time, Messiah shall be cut off or killed but not for himself, speaking of Jesus Christ's first coming, where he came and he was rejected. It says, and the people of the prince who is to come. So we get the prince who is to come mentioned here in Daniel 9, 26. The Antichrist shall destroy the city, that's the city of Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, that is the temple. The end of it shall be with a flood. Now we know that this actually happened, Jesus Christ. Uh, was crucified in sometime around 30 AD, uh, perhaps as late as 32 AD. We don't know exactly the year, but we know uh, that it happened uh, 483 years after uh, King Artaxerxes gave the decree uh, to Nehemiah to go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem, according to the prophecy uh, that Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday, presented himself as the king of the Jews, and he was rejected. And you remember that Jesus wept uh, over the city of Jerusalem. Because of his rejection, uh, it was going to bring the judgment of God upon that nation. God gave the nation almost 40 years before he judged them, uh, probably to allow the church to get a good head start. And in 70 AD, uh, the Romans came in and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They disassembled the temple stone by stone, even as Jesus said in Matthew 24, not one stone of the temple shall be left upon another. And the prophecy was fulfilled. What's interesting is the people of the prince who is to come tells us who the Antichrist is going to be in the sense that, not as uh, who he's going to be, and I'm going to tell you his name, but... We know that he's going to come from a revived Roman Empire because the Romans were the ones who destroyed the city. Uh, uh, Emperor Titus or General Titus before he became Emperor Titus uh, was the one who destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we know that the Roman 
um, government was never really supplanted by another power. The Roman government just sort of petered out in about 400 AD uh, because it was just rotten from within. They really weren't conquered by another nation. Uh, the Roman Empire just collapsed upon itself. There wasn't a foreign power that took it over and, uh, and took over it. Uh, it was sort of assimilated into uh, the European um, uh, nations and it was assimilated into uh, a Euro European uh, sort of a governmental structure with the, um, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the, the effect of Rome on Europe through the Roman Catholic Church's influence. But Rome was never, uh, and, and the, the empire of Rome was never conquered by another nation. And so we know, uh, according to the prophecies, and we're going to get into this as we get into Revelation chapter 13, and we look at uh, the beast system and the Antichrist that comes out of the uh, ten uh, kingdom confederacy of the revived Roman Empire, which means it's going to be uh, the land masses that made up the Roman Empire during the time uh, of, of Jesus' day and of uh, John the Beloved Apostles Day. So we know that this Antichrist is going to come out of a revived Roman Empire in the last days. We see the European Commission. Uh, we see the European Union. Uh, we see NATO. We see that everything is moving back to Europe. Uh, and uh, you see the uh, World Economic Forum, their plans to bring America down by 2030. Uh, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and all the billionaires that go over there and decide what the future is going to be for the rest of us uh, have decided that in 2030, America is no longer going to be a superpower anymore. Uh, America is no longer going to be the um, economy that is driving the world. Uh, America is no longer going to have the reserve currency. The U.S. dollar is no longer going to be, according to their plans by 2030, the main denominational currency of the banking system of the rest of the world, as we are right now. And so the plan is, is that America is going to diminish and the old Roman Empire is going to arise from the ashes. And then the Antichrist is going to come from this revived Roman Empire that's going to be based in Europe, obviously, because that's where the Roman Empire uh, is and, and was in ancient times. So this prince who is to come, we're told in verse 27, he, this Antichrist, he shall confirm a covenant or a treaty or an agreement with many for one week. We know that one week is a seven-year period of time. This is a week of years. We've looked at this in great detail uh, in previous studies. We're told, but in the middle of the week, in this seven-year period of time, he is going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. This is the abomination of desolations that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 24. If it's a seven-year period of time, and if it's halfway through that seven-year period of time when he is going to uh, do this abomination of desolations that's referred to the Antichrist, and, and we know from uh, the New Testament that he's going to go into a rebuilt temple, go into the Holy of Holies, de declare that he is God, demand to be worshipped as God, set up an image, require everyone to take the mark of the beast. We know that that's going to happen when? Halfway through the seven-year tribulation period. The tribulation period is seven years. The first half of the tribulation period is just called the tribulation period. The second half of the tribulation period is called in the New Testament over and over again, the great tribulation period. But the Antichrist uh, reveals who he is on the scene when he makes this covenant or this treaty with Israel and with the nations of the world. Uh, and that is how the world is going to know uh, that this is the one that the Bible predicted uh, that would come in the last days, who is otherwise known as the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 13, not to get ahead of ourselves in our study, but uh, Revelation 13 uh, talks a great deal about the Antichrist and about his kingdom uh, that he is going to uh, rise out uh, from out of Europe. 
We read in Revelation 13, verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Of course, the dragon is, is Satan. And I saw one of his heads, or one of these kings, these ten kings, uh, that are represented by the, the seven heads and the ten horns. He says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed after the beast. So one of the heads, this is a, a head of a nation or, or a kingdom. This is going to be uh, out of a ten kingdom confederacy out of the old uh, Roman Empire, and he's going to be one of the kings, one of ten, that's all of a sudden uh, going to be killed, or supposedly, or apparently killed. Um, Zechariah would indicate that it's an assassination attempt of this individual, but then he's going to come back to life, uh, supposedly. And so it is a counterfeit resurrection, because he is a counterfeit Christ. And at this point, he becomes the man. Uh, he's one of ten prior to this, one of ten kings, one of ten rulers on the scene. He will be the one who uh, initiates this contract or this covenant with the nation of Israel to start the tribulation period. But it's halfway through the tribulation period where he is supposedly killed. And then he is apparently resurrected as a counterfeit to Jesus Christ. Um, sacrifice for the sins of the world where he was dead and killed on the cross of Calvary, dead for three days and three nights, and then resurrected on the Thursday, third day. This is where Satan is going to be um, deceiving the world as a counterfeit Christ with a counterfeit death and resurrection. Verse 4 says, so they worship the dragon. The dragon is identified as the devil in Revelation chapter 12, who gave authority or power to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This one, this king uh, from the revived Roman Empire, uh, Europe, who was killed, who uh, it comes back to life, at least apparently comes back to life. And they're going to say, who is like this one? And from now on, the beast is um, pictured as being this one individual, the Antichrist. Verse 5 says, and he, the Antichrist, the beast, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years, which is half of a seven-year period of time. Remember, uh, they didn't have a 365-day calendar at this time. They had a 360-day calendar, so each month was uh, 30 days. And so if you have 42 months, you have three and a half years. This is what begins the great tribulation period then when he is uh, falsely resurrected and he is firmly in power. And then he goes on to require everyone to take his mark, the mark of the beast, the 666 upon their right hand or their forehead. And if you refuse to take his mark and to worship the devil and to worship the Antichrist, then those who are here uh, will be killed uh, because of their refusal to worship this beast or this Antichrist. I'm getting a little ahead of myself uh, as we're going to be in Revelation 13 uh, at some point here as in the future as we go through our study. Uh, and we will dig more into it, uh, this passage at that time. But my understanding is, is that when we see back in Revelation chapter 6 and uh, verse 2, the coming of the Antichrist onto the scene, that this is, of course, the beginning of the tribulation period. We know the tribulation period is, is a seven-year period of time, as we saw from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, the week of years, seven years, 42 months is half of that time, and that will be the great tribulation period, the second half. We also see that uh, this is what the Old Testament prophets called the time of Jacob's trouble or the time uh, of the indignation uh, of God being poured out upon the world. Now, the term Antichrist is never used in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, the only place that the uh, 
phrase or the name Antichrist is found in the Bible is actually in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 2, actually John is the same one uh, who would go on to write uh, the book of Revelation. But he is the author of the Gospel of John, also the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, we are told this phrase of this person, this individual who's coming, who is the Antichrist. Uh, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, 1 John 2.18, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So John tells us that there uh, is one Antichrist coming, uh, this one who is predicted to come from the scriptures, this one who is going to pretend to be Jesus Christ, who's going to have his own church, an apostate church that the book of Revelation uh, doesn't call a, a bride, a, a chaste virgin bride, like uh, the church of Jesus Christ is the bride of Christ. Uh, this is a whore. She's called a whore or a prostitute uh, of Babylon, the whore of Babylon. And that's his bride. That's his church. And uh, the Antichrist uh, is coming Uh, He says there are many antichrists who have come uh, by which we know that it is the last hour. And then he also says in 1 John in chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. So John tells us the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world at the time that John was reading this. The spirit of Antichrist uh, was already working among the uh, pagan Roman emperors, thinking that they were gods and uh, actually declaring the emperors of Rome to be worshipped as God. Uh, That you had to declare that Caesar is Lord or Caesar is the Lord above all gods. And if you refused to declare Caesar is Lord, you would be killed. That's why they fed them to the lions uh, in the Colosseums. And they were killed by bears and lions and tigers in the Colosseums uh, by the hundreds of thousands and even the millions. The Christians were persecuted terribly by the emperors of Rome because the emperors of Rome thought they were deity. They thought that they were a god and that they were uh, to be revered above all other gods. Uh, They even... uh, at some level, allowed Christians to participate in Christianity. But once a year, every single person in the Roman Empire had to declare Caesar as their Lord. And the Christians could not declare Caesar as their Lord because only Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And therefore, they were sentenced to death. So the spirit of Antichrist was already at work back then. You have many leaders who have come uh, who have had the spirit of Antichrist. Hitler had the spirit of Antichrist. He wanted to kill all the Jews and take over the whole world and reign for his uh, third Reich or his thousand year reign. Uh, thinking that he was like Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to have a thousand year reign. He wasn't even sufficient uh, for him uh, for seven years as the, as the Antichrist is going to get seven years, we're told in the book of Revelation. Um, he wanted a thousand years in the place of Jesus' millennial reign of Christ. Of course, Hitler was killed. Uh, Napoleon had this uh, Antichrist uh, spirit thinking that he was going to take over the world and, and so many others throughout human history. Of course, Nero uh, thought that Uh, You know, he was uh, the king of kings and and, and the god of all the gods. And he uh, was under the power of of Satan in the spirit of Antichrist, as were many of the Roman emperors. And and again, many uh, leaders and rulers of the world. So the spirit of Antichrist has been at work for 2,000 years. But there is one Antichrist that's going to come in the last days who's actually going to be the Antichrist. Not just uh, a forerunner uh, or, or, or someone who uh, is kind of giving you a preview of what the Antichrist is. Hitler was certainly a preview uh, of what the Antichrist is going to be, but he was not the Antichrist. How do we know? Uh, because he died. Uh, and uh, all the prophecies were not fulfilled and time went on. And here we are today some 80 years later. Uh, so this Antichrist is 
coming in the place of Jesus Christ. The term antichrist does not mean against Christ necessarily. The, the uh, anti, anti or anti at the beginning uh, could mean against or opposed to, uh, but it also can mean and can be translated from the Greek in the place of uh, or in lieu of, in the place of. So antichrist is going to come uh, as a false Christ, as a false messiah uh, of the Jews. He's going to claim to be the messiah of the Jews, which I believe means he's going to be Jewish and not some other nationality because um, he's, you know, obviously trying to uh, pretend to be the Jewish Messiah. That's who the Christ is, the Mashiach of the Jews. So he's going to come, uh, and, and we'll look at this more, uh, perhaps on Sunday we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on this and go back to the book of Daniel, because Daniel had a lot of revelation about the Antichrist. It says that he's not going to worship the God of his fathers, uh, that he's going to have no uh, natural affection for women, which many uh, b believe that he's going to be a homosexual male because he's not going to have any interest in women, apparently. Um, and uh, he is going to be um, a smooth talker. He's going to be a polished uh, politician. He's going to be promising everyone uh, everything that they want and telling everyone what they want to hear. But all the while, he is going to be continuing to accrue power, more and more power, to where then he is going to demand uh, to be worshipped as God and, and demand, uh, uh, especially Israel, uh, worship him uh, as their God and as their Messiah. And that's when the great tribulation period uh, will begin. We know uh, from other scriptures uh, in the book of Revelation, other passages, that the first half of the tribulation period is a 42-month period of time. Uh, for example, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So this would be the first half of the tribulation period. 42 months is three and a half years. That's the first half of the tribulation period. He says, I will give power to my two witnesses. This is likely going to be Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah. We will look at this in more detail when we get here. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Again, if you look at a 30-day calendar, a 30-day lunar calendar that they used, that would be exactly 42 months, 1,260 days, or three and a half years. That's the first half of the tribulation period. And we're told these are the two olive stands and the two lamp stands standing before the God of the earth. Again, we're also told that when the Antichrist comes to power at the last half of the tribulation period, that he's in power for 42 months. Revelation 13, 5, to him was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He's going to be known for his blasphemy. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints, these are the tribulation saints, and to overcome them. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. We know this cannot be the church. These are the tribulation saints because they're overcome by the devil. And the church can never be overcome by the devil because we're the body of Christ. It says, and authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. So we have a seven-year period of time. We have the first half of that seven-year period of time uh, as 42 months. And then the last half, which is the Great Tribulation period, which culminates with the return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. Now, we are told that this period of time uh, is for primarily, as we've looked at, it is primarily for the salvation of the nation of Israel. And again, we already uh, looked at Daniel uh, in chapter 9, 
Let me go back there again in verse 24. And you see that the prophecy of Daniel related to the coming of the Antichrist and uh, the seven-year covenant that uh, is going to allow for uh, Israel to rebuild their temple, that it's all pertaining to the salvation of the nation of Israel. That's what the book of Revelation and eschatology is really all about. Of course, it's about the rapture and us being taken to heaven to be with the Lord. But the seven-year tribulation period is so that God can once again um, reconnect uh, with his people, the nation of Israel, to uh, reaffirm his covenant with them, that he's not rejected them. Uh, the church age will be over, and then God is going to pivot back to save the nation of Israel, to fulfill all of the promises and all of the prophecies in the Old Testament to the Jews. And Jesus Christ is coming back to be a Jewish Savior. He's coming back to save the Jews. That is the message of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the book of Revelation. But we read in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, 70 sevens or 70 weeks of years are determined for your people and for your holy city. This is for Daniel's people, the Jews, the nation of Israel. This is for Daniel's holy city, which is the city of Jerusalem. And here's what is going to culminate at the end of those uh, 77s or 490 years to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So once that final seven-year period of time is completed and Jesus Christ returns to save the nation of Israel from the Antichrist, Jesus Christ sets his feet, according to Zechariah chapter 12, on the Mount of Olives, just outside of the city of Jerusalem, and then destroys the Antichrist and his armies with the sword which comes forth out of his mouth, then national salvation will come for the Jews. It'll be the end of their transgression and end of their sins. They will be reconciled for their iniquity. They will have everlasting righteousness. They will have the end of vision and prophecy. In other words, all of the visions and prophecies of their coming king and of their advent of their kingdom uh, will have been fulfilled. And the anointing of the most holy place is going to be when Jesus Christ, the Holy One, is seated on his throne in the Holy of Holies uh, in a temple in Jerusalem. But <clears throat> prior to uh, all of this uh, coming to pass, there is this seven-year period of time uh, which is imminent for the world, and this is the tribulation period. We, we haven't looked at this in, in a lot of detail in this study, um, but, but I'll just share a couple of verses with you. In Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 5, we read this about this period uh, of this seven-year tribulation time period. For thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 30 verse 5, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great, so there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So this is called, it says that day is great. This is called in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord. And it's not a 24-hour day. It is a period of time where God is judging this world with the end results being to save the nation of Israel. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another name for Israel, but we're told Jacob or Israel will be saved out of it. We're also told in Daniel, Daniel had uh, been shown a lot about this period of time and the details of it in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince that stands watch over the sons of your people. That's Michael the archangel. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people, who's Daniel's people? The Jews, shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And so this is a time of terrible uh, uh, tribulation on the earth. Uh, we're told such as never was since there was a nation. I mean, we saw the tribulation of October 7th, what they suffered. We saw the tribulation that the Jews suffered 6 million 
uh, uh, men, women, and children killed uh, in the Holocaust uh, of the Nazis and uh, of Hitler's uh, final solution. And this is going to be worse than that. This is the worst thing that's going to happen in Israel's history as a nation. There shall be a time of trouble, he says, such as never uh, was since there was a nation, the nation of Israel. Isaiah was shown a lot of this uh, tribulation period called the day of the Lord and what it's going to look like. In Isaiah chapter 2, we read this in verse 10. Enter the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, Isaiah 2.11. The haughtiness or high-mindedness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything that's lifted up, and it shall be brought low. This is the day of the Lord, and it's where the Lord is going to come and judge the haughtiness of men. We read in verse 19 of Isaiah chapter 2, he says, They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver, his idols of gold, which they made, each for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. So this is the day of the Lord. This is the wrath of God that is coming upon this world. In Isaiah chapter 13, we read this about this period of the day of the Lord. In verse 2, Isaiah 13, 2, Lift up a banner on the high mountain, raise your voice to them, wave your hand, that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exultation. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like that of many peoples. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. They come from a far country from the end of heaven. The Lord in his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. And that word indignation is an Old Testament word for the great tribulation period. Verse 6 of Isaiah 13 Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, verse 9. Cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it, from from the land. Destroy the sinners from the earth. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. God says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger it shall be as the hunted gazelle and as a sheep that no man takes up every man will turn to his own people and everyone will flee to his own land everyone who is found will be thrust through and everyone who is captured will fall by the edge of the sword their children will also be dashed to pieces before their eyes their houses will be plundered and their wives Ravished, And that is what is coming when God judges the Antichrist and his kingdom uh, as Jesus Christ comes back 
to judge this world for sin uh, and to set up his uh, thousand-year kingdom and then to reign forever and ever. One more scripture in Amos chapter 5. There's a lot of Old Testament prophecies about this period of time, as you would imagine. Amos chapter 5 and verse 16 talks about this same period, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord says this, there shall be wailing in all the streets and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning and skillful lamenters to wailing. In all vineyards, there shall be wailing for I will pass through you, says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord for what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? It, is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Uh, the Lord is going to turn off all the lights of this world and he is going to come and judge. And there's going to be nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. So in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, this is what is begun, is the tribulation period. Now, Bible scholars differ in their interpretation of whether or not Revelation chapter 6, which details the uh, first six seals of the seven sealed scroll being cracked open and opened up. Uh, some believe that it is chronological in the sense that uh, it, it goes from the beginning to the end, that, you know, Revelation chapter 6 uh, precedes Revelation chapter 7 chronologically and precedes Revelation chapter 8 all the way through Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus Christ returns. But there are other Bible scholars uh, who believe that uh, Revelation chapter 6 is an overview of the entire tribulation period. And that's what I think we are told in Revelation 6. So God gives us with the first six seals that are broken, basically an overview of what the rest of the book of Revelation is going to detail for us and give us um, you know, tremendous detail into what it's going uh, to be like for those who are here on the earth. So again, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So we see right away that the Antichrist comes riding in on a white horse. Uh, again, as a fake, as a uh, deceiver, as a phony uh, Christ. Because Jesus Christ, we're told in Revelation chapter 19, is going to return in judgment at the end of the tribulation period, riding on a white horse. And the white horse was significant because in Rome, uh, if you were a king... Uh, you would uh, perhaps ride, especially, you know, in Jewish, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition of the Jewish kings, they would ride in on a mule or on a donkey when they were coming in peace. Remember Jesus, when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, what did he ride? He rode a donkey, uh, not on a, on a horse, not on a stallion. So this would indicate that he was coming in peace. And of course, he was rejected uh, by the nation of Israel and the whole world, not just the Jews, but the Romans as well. And, and so, but when he comes back the second time, he rides on the white horse, which is when the Romans would ride into battle, they would go into battle on a white stallion when they were going to engage in battle or a general would ride a white stallion to go into war. And we know that Jesus Christ, when he returns, comes back on a white horse. The first time he came to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward man. The second time he comes to destroy uh, the Antichrist, the armies of the Antichrist, and all of those who have taken the mark of the beast to follow the Antichrist. In Revelation 19, 11, we're told, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages 
war. And we're told that this is the one who is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And also his name is called the Word of God. So this is Jesus riding in at the end of the tribulation on a white horse to uh, come to make war upon this world. The Antichrist is a phony. He rides in on a white horse to act like he's, you know, the, the cowboy on the white horse with the white hat on, that he's the good guy. Uh, but really, he is uh, a deceiver. He's a false Christ. He is in the place of Christ. He's instead of Jesus Christ. That's what Antichrist means. And he is completely opposite of who Jesus is uh, in every uh, facet. We're told that he has a bow. But we're not told that he has any arrows. And so it's interesting. Normally a a ruler would come, you know, riding on a white horse to make war with a sword in his hand. Jesus comes with a sword that comes forth from his mouth. But this one comes with a bow without any arrows. So he has a weapon, but he doesn't use his weapon. He has a crown, which is, uh, means that he was a king, and he's one of the ten kings that we're going to see from the revived Roman Empire, and he's the one that ends up taking over the whole uh, kit and caboodle, the whole Roman, revived Roman Empire, and then the whole world. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, the interesting thing is he conquers the world without having to fire a shot. He conquers the world without having to declare war on anyone. So he is going to use deceit. He is going to use, Daniel says, intrigue. He is going to use his silver tongue. He's a silver-tongued politician. And he is going to uh, finagle his way to be the top of the heap at that time. Now, it is interesting that Revelation uh, chapter 6 goes into the second seal and to the third seal, the fourth seal, the fifth seal, the sixth seal. And we see a, a very interesting parallel to the chronology that Jesus gives us in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. For example, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, Jesus answered when they asked, what, what will uh, be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? Jesus' disciples asked him this, and he answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, Matthew 24, 5, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, and will deceive many. So right away we see a parallel to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. I I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquered and to conquer. Who is this? This is the Antichrist. So Jesus gives us a parallel uh, and John tells us basically the same thing. That he is going to come as the Christ or as the Messiah. In verse 6 of Matthew 24, Jesus says, continuing, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, what do we see back in Revelation 6 and verse 3 when the second seal is broken? When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So we see the chronological parallel to what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 24. Wars and rumors of wars, and there is going to be great war that is going to take place. Now, even now, we see wars and rumors of wars. We see false Christ, but it's not the Antichrist yet. Uh, We see nations against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, but it's not that time yet because the Antichrist has to be revealed, riding on his white horse, sign the treaty with Israel. The stopwatch begins for the seven-year tribulation period. That hasn't happened yet. We continue to read in verse uh, 7, the second part of verse 7, Jesus says, and there will be famines, pestilences, And earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. And literally the beginning of 
labor pains, which means that these are going to come with greater frequency and intensity on the whole earth until the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we go back and look at, at Revelation chapter 6, we see uh, the third seal after war and the, wider, or the rider uh, on the red horse to take peace from the earth. To, uh, to him was given a great sword that the people will kill one another during that time. The third seal says this, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. And that's exactly what Jesus said would follow the wars, the nations and kingdoms at war with each other. He says, and there's going to be famines and pestilences. Uh, this is going to create great scarcity, food scarcity on the earth to where people are going to be paying a day's wage. A denarius was a day's wage for a Roman soldier for a quart of wheat. That's literally so that you could have a quart of wheat to eat for you and your family. And a quart of wheat is not going to feed very many people. One day's wage is going to buy just a quart of wheat during that time because food is going to be so scarce during the tribulation period. And three quarts of barley for a day's wage. Barley is really not even edible for humans. That's animal food. That's for horses or cattle. And so uh, it talks about great scarcity. Uh, it talks about hyperinflation for food during that time. And then he says, do not harm the oil and the wine that they're still going to be the wealthy and the rich are still going to have all of their luxuries during that time while the rest of the world is starving to death. We read in verse 9 of Matthew 24, the next phase is, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And Jesus is speaking specifically to the Jews here as we see because he's talking about the abomination of desolation uh, and not going back uh, to get your cloak. Uh, flee to the, uh, to, to the mountains if you're in Judea. Pray that it doesn't happen on Shabbat or the Sabbath day. So he's talking to the Jews here that are going to be uh, alive during this time. He says, they're going to deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Isn't it interesting? The Jews are being hated by all nations even now, and it's not even for Christ's name's sake yet, but at the time, uh, it will be. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So we see persecution against God's people that is going to be taking place, rampant persecution at that time. And what do we see with the fourth uh, seal? We see the fourth seal. I heard the fourth living creature saying, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse, the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Then... He opened the fifth seal. I saw the altar, uh, under the altar, the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. These are the tribulation saints. And it was said to them they should rest a little while longer until both their number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were complete. So we have all of these things given chronologically in Matthew chapter 24, and they're listed in the same chronological order uh, in Revelation chapter 6. And then we see the cosmic disturbances, uh, the sixth seal, Revelation 6 verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, behold... There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, 
and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. And so what do we see uh, in Matthew chapter 24 in verse 29? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and so i believe that revelation chapter 6 basically is a summary or an overview of the entire tribulation period and then we get into different periods where we have a heavenly scene. We go back and we see the earthly scene. There's times where there is figurative language that is used that will break down all of the different figurative characters and uh, what they mean and, and, and the animals and the beasts and what they mean because the scripture will uh, identify uh, with scripture. And uh, then at the end of the tribulation period, of course, is where Jesus Christ returns to save the nation of Israel to set up his thousand year reign for uh, basically for the whole earth where he is going to uh, reverse the curse. He is going to make it back like it was in the Garden of Eden again. And then after that thousand year period of time uh, is, is when it's all over. Um, the heavens and the earth uh, just scatter and they're no longer to be seen. Then it's the great white throne judgment. And after the great white throne judgment, that's when God creates a new heavens and the new earth wherein righteousness dwells. So this was, um, I knew that I wasn't going to get to most of what I had marked out here tonight. Um, I got started a little bit late uh, because of the update on Israel, but uh, we will pick up on Sunday and we will look, uh, the whole message on Sunday is going to be looking at this individual, the Antichrist. But I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction to the tribulation period uh, and also an introduction uh, to Revelation chapter 6 with the six seals broken, giving an overview of the entirety uh, of what is coming upon this world during the tribulation period. I know you're all ready to go get some pecan pie, and so uh, I'm going to call the worship team back up to close us with a song, and uh, we're, we're going to uh, close in prayer. Father, thank you for telling us the future in advance, Lord God. I know that um, especially the first time that people read the book of Revelation, the first time that they hear it, it can be very, very confusing. Uh, and it could seem complicated, but we know, Lord God, that you give us understanding through your spirit, Lord. And we know, Lord, that scripture confirms scripture and, and scripture uh, proves scripture. And so uh, as we uh, get into this next section, this next phase of our study through the book of Revelation, where we are uh, beginning to take a look at the tribulation period, the coming of the Antichrist and everything else that's coming upon this world, uh, we do pray, Father, that you would give us understanding, uh, Father, that the uh, scripture would make sense to us, Lord, that we would be able to have a grasp of these prophecies, Father God, and that we would even be able to communicate uh, these teachings to others, Lord, uh, because we know your desire, Lord, is that you would reach everyone with the gospel message before this time comes. Your desire is that... Uh, None would perish, Lord, but would all, all would come to repentance. You don't want anyone to go to hell. Jesus, you tell us that you created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels. You never intended for man to go there, but many men will choose to reject you. Many men would rather follow the lust of their own flesh and the God of this world, and they are going to follow their God to his end in the lake of fire. But we thank you, Lord, uh, that we all have the possibility and the opportunity to follow you, Jesus, to your end, uh, to um, the um, new heavens and the new earth wherein righteousness dwells, where there's no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death, there's no more pain, Lord, there's no more night, and where we will live and we will reign and rule with you and live with you 
first for a thousand years on the earth, Lord, and then in heaven forever and ever. So we thank you for this book, the book of Revelation. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us the opportunity to study this book uh, as so much of it is, is so relevant in our days, Lord. And we just ask you continue to bless us and you continue to watch over us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.